Oh, welcome back. This is experiment number 11, the last of 11 experiments that we'll be doing in uh, first year physics labs here at York University. As you can see, I'm looking through the telescope component of a spectrometer. We're going to use this spectrometer to determine the contents in these two different discharge tubes. There's two gases in these tubes, and our goal today as forensic scientists is to use a non-destructive test to determine what the contents are on, in, in these two um, discharge tubes. So let me mount one of them on our 5,000 volt power supply. These are spring-loaded. Once you um, attach the tube to the power supply and you turn on the switch, you will see that um, the gas now will be almost totally ionized and it will actually give off light. This uh, bluish light that you see right now is a mixture of colors. And um, in order to um, uh, you know, determine what the gas is um, in this uh, discharge tube, we are going to look at the colors, individual colors, the spectral lines, that are produced by this um, mixture of colors, this gas. And um, once um, we um, determine what the wavelengths are for all those spectral lines for this particular gas, we are going to go to a chart on the opposite side of the lab here, and we are going to compare it with the known spectral lines of um, other gases. Each gas has a unique spectral fingerprint. Once we see this uh, spectral fingerprint, um, either in the labs or looking at a, a telescope using a, spectrometer, using a spectrometer or a diffraction rating, which I'll describe um, a little bit more in a minute, um, and we're looking at um, a, a galaxy far away, if we see that same spectral fingerprint um, in that distant galaxy, we don't have to go to that galaxy and bring back a sample. We know that that gas is present there. So, um, how do we set up uh, this experiment to be able to break up this light into its individual color components and um, do the analysis and determine what gas is uh, present? Well, first of all, we have to set up um, the, this spectrometer. And the first thing we have to do is um, do what I was doing uh, a few minutes ago, focus the telescope at something very far away. So once you have focused this telescope at something that's very far away, the light rays from that object will be coming in parallel. So your telescope now is uh, preset to accept parallel light rays. Then you now have to focus the collimator tube to produce parallel light rays. And how do you do that? Swing the telescope in front of the collimator, look through it, and um, you should see an out-of-focus image of the slit. There's a slit opening at the end of the collimator. And if you align it um, uh, properly through the eyepiece, you will see an out-of-focus image of that slit. What then you're supposed to do is focus the collimator tube with this little knob here. Okay. And you keep doing it back and forth until you get a nice sharp image of the slit in the eyepiece. Once you've done that, this um, draw tube has been extended to a special distance where this um, slit opening is now at the focal length of this lens. So light entering the slit opening will come out parallel. The telescope is pre-focused to accept parallel light rays. So between the collimator and the telescope, you have parallel light rays. And mounted on this stage, perpendicular to this um, um, beam of parallel light rays, we are going to mount our diffraction grating like this. What is a diffraction grating? A diffraction grating is a device similar to a prism, but uh, working on a different principle, of course, that actually breaks up light it's in, into its individual wavelengths. A prism will produce one complete spectrum, but a diffraction grating produces repeating spectrums. So what uh, we want you to do in this experiment is observe the first two complete spectrums produced by a diffraction grating. The first uh, sequence of colors that you'll see will be n equals 1, the first order spectrum, and 
as you move the telescope further to the right, at greater angles still, um, then you'll see another sequence of colors, okay? And um, the same sequence of colors will be the same as for n equals 1, but this time this will be the n equals 2 um, uh, spectrum. And um, uh, without going into further details, our goal is to identify the gases in these two discharge tubes. Um, they are coded with a two-letter code, which um, has to be included uh, with your lab report on, on your table. And um, if you do uh, all the measurements correctly, then um, uh, you will be able to identify the gas that's um, in these discharge tubes. Now, you will also notice that um, when the telescope uh, swings either to the right or to the left, it doesn't matter which direction you go. Um, the Vernier scale here um, is a precision one. It's a, it's, it's a Vernier scale with angular measurements. You can actually measure to the nearest minute or arc minute, not to the nearest degree, but to the uh, nearest arc minute. So what I'll do is um, I'll show you how to read this Vernier scale correctly because when you align the telescope and the collimator in a perfect line, so the slit opening and the crosshair are on opposite sides and overlapping. This angle here will not be zero, but uh, it will be your zero angle. And you need to measure the zero angle correctly, because if your zero angle is wrong, then all your other angles later on were, are going to be wrong too, because you need to subtract the zero angle from all your other angles. So we'll go over to the table uh, to um, um, a chart next door, and I'll show you how to read the Vernier scale. Okay, so come with me. This chart that we have here is a blown up version of the Vernier scale on your spectrometer. And um, this will allow you to read it correctly. Before I tell you how to read it, let me just mention um, a couple of things that you need to know. Vernier scales consist of a large scale and a small scale. How is the, uh, the small scale related to the, small, uh, to the big scale? It's, uh, uh, it's related this way. The smallest division on the big scale is always blown up to form the small scale. So the smallest division here is half a degree. So the small scale here is half a degree blown up. The reason it's expressed as 0 to 30 is because there's 60 minutes or arc minutes in one degree. So that means in half a degree, um, it would be 30 minutes. So this half a degree is expressed in minutes. Okay. Now, how do you read a Vernier scale? You always read it in two steps. First, you take an approximate reading, and then you add something to that approximate reading to get your final exact reading. So right now, you will notice that um, the approximate reading, always taken at the beginning of the small scale, is between 20 and a half and 21 degrees. So what we're going to do is we're going to add something to the 20 and a half degrees, our approximate reading. What do we add? If you look along the top scale and you look along the bottom scale, there will be a line from the top scale and a, a line from the bottom scale that uniquely lines up, just one and it happens to occur at the 10 minute mark. So what is our final angle then? Our final precise angle? It's 20 and a half degrees plus 10 minutes. And of course, we, as we never um, leave things in mixed units, like in meters and millimeters and things like that, um, we would want to have everything expressed in degrees. We would convert the 10 minutes into degrees. So how do we do that? We divide uh, 10 by 60 and we get degrees, which is a point, uh, 0.18 degrees, and we add it to our approximate reading. So our final precise reading, expressed totally in degrees, is 20.68 degrees. And that's it for our Vernier scale, okay? Finally, we'll go over to this chart here, and uh, once you've actually determined the wavelengths of uh, the spectral lines of the mystery gases, the two mystery gases or unknown gases that you're going to be, uh, 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 you know, uh, determining in this experiment. You come to this uh, chart and you match the spectral fingerprints of uh, the gases that you have with the spectral fingerprints of a few known compounds or gases, okay? Now, let's say um, one of your uh, spectral lines was about um, 
uh, 5,800 angstroms. Well, this um, chart goes from 4,000 angstroms to 7,500 angstroms. This is in the visible range, which our eyes are sensitive to. So 5,800 uh, angstroms would be somewhere about here. Okay. So allowing about 100 angstroms um, you know, uncertainty, you make a little window and you say, okay, um, it could be mercury, could be helium, could be barium, and it could be sodium. So we've already narrowed it down to th uh, four different gases. Then we try to match another line. And if our other line is under 5,500 angstroms, and it's a green one, we do the same thing here. We see, okay, mercury has both the yellow and the green. Helium doesn't have uh, a green line, so it gets eliminated as a possible uh, gas. Barium has some double uh, green lines. That gets eliminated because we only saw one. And hydrogen doesn't have one either, or sodium rather, sorry. So um, the only candidate that uh, is still in the running is this one. And if the other spectral lines, two purples and two reds, uh, also match the spectrum, then you've uh, positively identified your gas as being mercury. And that's it. So thank you for your attention. And uh, during the lab, myself and your lab instructor will be here to help you out if you have any questions or difficulties uh, operating or, or using the equipment.